Okay, is that a go? Stand by. That's a wait for you. Okay. We are. All right. Well, good evening. We're going to be starting chapter six part tonight, and we're doing chapter six in two pieces because chapter six has got more pool questions in it than any other chapter in the book. So we can't possibly do it all on one night. So we'll we'll have some fun. We're going to be talking about amplifiers and signal processing. That's the subject. But first, I'd like to welcome anybody that's watching us online or the videos after the fact. We do have numbers posted, and we're always happy to, uh, to take calls and, and questions, so feel free to take advantage of that if you'd like. With that, we'll go ahead and get started. I, uh, any questions first? Good, because I don't have any answers. Those, those are coming this evening. Okay, here we go. I've got a couple of pictures here uh, talking about amplifiers. This one is a little chip. A, an op amp. We're going to be talking about op, op amps tonight. And this is the Elecraft 1500 watt uh, solid state amp, which I do not own. It's about $6,000. So if any of you want to put something on your Christmas list, um, you might, might want to do that. Are we okay back there, Doug? Okay. All right. We're still debugging some of our video streaming stuff. So uh, be patient with this if need be. So amplifiers, we're going to be talking about RF, IF, and audio. And amplifiers cover the range of high, low power, and everything in between. We're talking a little bit about gain. We've talked about decibels in the past. We won't be doing any calculations with decibels. So that's good news. Amplifiers can match impedance. we have mentioning that. And uh, this particular section will cover transistors, tubes, and ICs, not so much on tubes. Kessler had a good... Um, let me get my laser pointer working here. There we go. Uh, Dave Kastler in his opening video, or his uh, introductory videos for these first two sections, we'll just be covering the first two sections of this chapter tonight, 6.1 and 6.2. But he had an interesting concept about three terminal devices, input, output, with a shared common in between. And that fits real well with some of the things that we're talking about here. So we'll consider that in terms of transistors. And there's three flavors that we're gonna be looking at. The common emitter configuration, common base configuration, and the common collector. What we've done here basically is taken the most uh, common configuration, the common emitter, and as we just twist it around into different positions, you'll see that we have, in, in this case, just talk about the common emitter, the input is between the base and the emitter, Output is a collector, it's, it's the emitter in common, thus called the common emitter. Now the reason that I put common emitter in blue is because in the pool questions, there's only one configuration that you need to identify, and that's the common emitter. But we will be talking about um, all of them briefly. The exact same thing can be done with field effect transistors and um, tubes. So tubes uh, will appear in high-powered amplifiers. They're still the most economical form of amplifier that you can get today. That transistors and ICs have replaced everything else in ham radio. So here's our common emitter circuit. It's the most often used configuration. You'll see this frequently than any other configuration. And the input, I've duplicated what we had before. The input is from the base or it goes to, into the base, then the output is out of the collector. Maybe no mind, we just have a little audio issue here. Okay. Okay. I'll keep on a going. And um, I have provided these little yellow, uh, I, I try to give you all of the tips that I can for the pool questions. And one real easy way to recognize this, when you see it in the diagram, and the pool question asks you to identify the amplifier type, the one that has the two capacitors shown in yellow here is uh, the common emitter configuration. So you can figure it out two ways, either by remembering that or by seeing what the signals are coming in and going out. So we're coming in the base and then the on the input side, the low is ground. And then uh, here we've got the output. So the other circuits, this, this is pretty simple. This one, we've now added the other components that surround it that will make it work. 
R1 and R2, notice that's in blue, form a voltage divider for fixed bias. Well, what in the world does that mean? Well, let's take a look. This is the plus voltage coming in, the plus side of a battery, for example, and then R1 and R2 are in series. If our input voltage was 12 volts, and these resistors were the same value, we'd have six volts at this point, each resistor would drop six volts. So we'd have six volts at, uh, at this point. So this voltage divider provides the fixed bias for the transistor to operate. R3 is used to self, as self-bias to prevent thermal runaway. Now transistors have got a real interesting characteristic. When they get hot, the gain increases. And if the gain increases, they would draw more current, making them even hotter. So we've got what's called thermal runaway. If the transistor starts getting hot, it conducts more. That increases the gain, it conducts more. And eventually, uh, it will let out the magic smoke. So what this resistor does in this configuration, if the transistor starts drawing more current, more current's gonna flow through this resistor. And if we remember Ohm's law, more current will result in a, a greater voltage across R3. That greater voltage in comparison to what's coming in at the base will slow the transistor down a little bit and prevent thermal runaway. The common emitter circuit is the configuration of the three we talked about that provides the highest gain. We'll see that one most frequently. Here's the common base. We've twisted the transistor configuration a little bit. There's nothing blue here, but this is just kind of for background and context. The input is on the emitter right here, and the output is on the collector. It's a low impedance input. This kind of circuit is commonly used for front ends and receivers because the your antenna is a 50 ohm uh, circuit typically, low impedance. So that's a place you'll typically see this configuration in high impedance output, primarily used as an impedance converter, low to high. And then the next one, common collector, is just opposite in terms of what it does for impedance matching. Also called an emitter follower, because our input is here on the base, and the output is actually fed through this uh, coupling capacitor off the emitter. So you can kind of see why it's called an emitter coupler. Now this resistor looks very similar to the one that we saw previously, but in this case, it serves a different purpose. It has a different name in the pool questions. R is the emitter load resistor in this case. So we'll have a chance to look at that again so you can tell the two apart. They said this was opposite. It's high input impedance, low output impedance. So it's, it has applications where we have to do impedance matching very often used as a buffer amplifier. Some circuits, such as an oscillator, if you try to take, if you try to load it down uh, too severely, it'll change the frequency of the oscillator. So you normally would put a buffer afterwards. That would be a common application for this. All right, and identifying the common emitter, I already kind of gave you the clue here. It's the one with the, the two capacitors marked in yellow. And I put that alongside the common collector so you could see the difference easily. Only one capacitor. Or you can trace the signal flows if, if that's easier for you. Very similar orientation in the diagram. Now vacuum tubes. And I mentioned that we still have vacuum tubes and high power amplifiers. It's the most economical way to get high power right now. Uh, because I lived in a subdivision with neighbors all around me, I didn't want to run any more than 100 watts because I didn't want the, the issue with neighbors saying, why are my lights blinking on and off and stuff like that. Which does happen. Uh, touch lamps are no notorious for RF. We had one in our kitchen, and every time I would try to operate on CW, the lights would be blinking, going up and down in intensity in the kitchen. <laughs> so <laughs> that was kind of funny. I didn't want that happening with my neighbors. So vacuum tubes, um, in terms of comparison to transistors, I, I guess I was talking about high power and why I wasn't running it. Now that I've moved, I'm very interested in getting to an amplifier when I get my station set up. I'll start out with a 100, watts, 100 watt transceiver again. So 
in comparison to a transistor, um, the base of a transistor is analogous to the grid of a tube, plate, collector, cathode, the emitter. So we can have a common base, common collector. Um, the grounded grid is, is a configuration that's used as an input switch for an amplifier very often. Common cathode, so that there's an equivalent version uh, between tubes and transistors for amplifier configurations. And the grounded grid has got a low input impedance, which you might want to remember. Uh, and that's a good thing because it matches well to 50 ohms. And we're right into some pool questions. So we'll see how well we did. In this figure, what is the purpose of R1 and R2? R1 and R2. Bias. Fixed bias, correct. Forms a voltage divider network to bias the transistor. What is the purpose of R3? Before you answer that, what kind of configuration is this? Common emitter. Okay, so with the common emitter, R3 is for? The self-bias was there to prevent the thermal runaway. And I might not have used that word self-bias. I, I mentioned that as the transistor draws more current, more voltage will be dropped across R3, which changes the bias so that the transistor won't conduct as much. But I don't know if I use the word self-bias. What's that? It's in, the book. it's in the book, yeah, but who reads the book? You know, it's a, well, Sharon probably does. It's just guys that don't read the instruction manual, right? But it's in the book, thank you. <clears throat> what type of amplifier circuit is shown here? All right, hopefully you remember the trick. That's the common emitter, We've got the two capacitors here. And the output is on the collector. What is the purpose of R? And before you answer that, what configuration is this? That's the common collector. It's the one that looks a little bit similar. And in the common collector, the purpose of R is? Well, it's coming off the emitter. So it, it's called the emitter load resistor. Another way to look at it is the output comes right off the emitter. So the emitter load, the emitter output, that kind of ties together. So that, that might help you remember that one as well. What is one way to prevent thermal runaway in a bipolar transistor amplifier? C. C, right. That was our resistor. What is a characteristic of a grounded grid amplifier? The one and only tube question here. Yes. If it's used as an amplifier, a high power amplifier, the output of your transmitter is usually about 50 ohms and a grounded grid uh, input on a tube amplifier matches real well to 50 ohms. So low input impedance. All right, we've made it through that part of the section. Now we're gonna talk about operational amplifiers. Uh, I call this the Swiss army knife of amplifiers. Here's a picture of a 741 chip, very common analog chip. The reason I call it a Swiss Army knife is because it can do just about anything. AC amplifier, DC amplifier, we'll have a definition coming up, I think, in the next slide. Uh, all of the amplifiers we looked at so far would only work on AC. This one will also work on DC. It can be used as a filter, a comparator, it can be used in impedance matching, it can be an oscillator, and there's a whole bunch of uh, additional things. There's a, a Wikipedia article here. I also brought a, a reference in here. This is the ARRL handbook. It's the 2018 version. Does anybody have a handbook right now? It's like the uh, the, the Bible, so to speak, of, of amateur radio. It's uh, it, it, everything that we talk about here. Um, we're scratching the surface. You'll you'll see the next three levels in, in this book. So this, in addition to the Elecraft 1500 watt amplifier, you want to put on your Christmas list. Uh, you probably want to put one of these on too, if you want to continue, you know, going going forward in, in amateur. I brought I brought one here uh, so that you could just kind of leaf through it. 
but anything that you don't understand from what we've talked about here, it's probably got three times as much material as, as what we've talked about in class. So I just brought it so you could look at it. And it's got a lot more applications for op amps. Op amp stands for operational amplifier. Does anybody know where it got that name? These go way back in history. When they first came out, uh, because it would amplify DC, it would do things like figure out, you could uh, wire them so that you could put in a certain voltage and get a logarithmic value of that voltage out of the circuit. Uh, so operational amp, they were actually using them for, to do analog mathematical calculations, thus operational, the word operational amp. So like an analog um, scientific calculator, if you will, configured the correct way. Here's a little bit more information, and here's a definition that'll be important. It's direct coupled. Remember I said it would uh, amplify DC as well as AC? That's because it's direct coupled. There aren't any internal capacitors. So if we, had a, a, if we were to apply a, a tenth of a volt DC on the input, and its gain was 10, we would get one volt on the output DC. We'll talk about positive or negative in a little bit. So direct coupled, high gain, um, and high gain is really crazy. It's like 100 or 120 dB they're capable of, which is like a billion times amplification. So that, that's pretty amazing. Two inputs, we've got the inverting input, which has the minus sign on it, and then the non-inverting. And so what happens, the difference between these two is what gets amplified. Now we've got the ideal op amp comp or ideal op amp and then practical op amp. So we've got the theory and the practice. And some of these are, will, will be important. The ideal op amp will have infinite input impedance. Well, that, that's pretty nice. It'll have zero output impedance. That means you could have a very small signal that would generate enough power to run an entire city, right? Well, in theory. Infinite voltage gain. Not really true, but um, in theory, the ideal op amp, flat frequency response. That'll show up. And zero output when the input is zero. All right, well, what is what really happens in the real world? Let's go through that. Uh, the way that the pull question is li listed, it calls it a very high input impedance rather than in infinite, which, which is the practical truth. Zero output impedance, it's actually a, has a very low output impedance. So these are the words that you'll want to be looking for. Infinite voltage gain, it can be as high as 120 dB. We'll talk about open loop and closed loop coming up. And uh, if, if you do the calculation, which actually Gary did the last class, it's like 1 billion voltage gain. Flat frequency response, what really happens is that the gain decreases with frequency. But in this case, the pool question asks about the ideal op amp. So when we get to that question, you want to answer flat frequency response. And it'll say ideal. Zero output when the input is zero. That's actually very hard to attain. There's something called the differential input voltage, uh, which is the difference that you have to generate on the input to actually achieve the zero output. So this is the ideal, the theoretical, this is what really happens. No blue text here, but it's background that we'll need for what's coming up. So the gain and frequency response is determined by feedback components. And the feedback in this case is just a resistor called RF, F for feedback. Here's the output, and it's feeding some of its output back to the non-inverting input. And we're going to see next that the voltage gain is determined by the values of R1 and RF. So if, if you divide R1 into RF, you'll get the gain of the device. There's four pool questions that, that ask us to calculate those, and they're really, really easy. Um, I don't think I even have it on the reference sheet. Uh, they're so easy. And basically, anytime you see one of those, it's the bigger value divided by the smaller value. Excuse me. In this example, a circuit's using the inverting input, the negative. 
so the result will be negative. In other words, if we put a tenth of a volt positive here, we're going to get, and the gain is 10, we're going to get one volt negative out here. And what comes in is inverted, multiplied times the gain, and appears on the output. A closed loop, it's called closed loop because of this feedback resistor. If this resistor wasn't there, the device would be running in what's called open loop. So closed loop because of the feedback resistor. This is the standard amplifier configuration. And the gain is controlled by RF divided by R1. Now you can put all kinds of other things in this feedback loop, um, inductors, capacitors, uh, and make the op amp jump through hoops. It can become a filter or an oscillator, uh, just all kinds of things. Now here's a sample gain calculation. So if RF were 68K and R1 were 1800, the gain would just be uh, 68 divided 1.8. You have to make sure that the units are the same. So I converted the 100, or 1800 ohms to 1.8K, so 68 divided by 1.8 rounds out to 38. We'll give you a chance to do some of these on your calculator in a little bit. For the exam, whatever they give you, it just turns out that the bigger value gets divided by the smaller value. Now you can probably remember that it's RF divided by R1, but you don't even have to do that if you can just remember bigger divided by smaller. So again, I'm trying to give you every trick I can think of to help you out here. All right, here's another one. Let's use an input voltage of 0.16 volts DC. We're gonna do something similar to this in a pool question, and it works exactly the same way. So let's use an input voltage of 0.16, and the gain of 38. So if we've got a 0.16 input voltage, what would be the output voltage? It would be the 0.16 times the gain, 38, be 6.1, but because we're feeding it on the inverting input, it's going to be negative. So instead of 6.1, it'll be negative, or negative 6.1 volts. So that's as complicated as it gets for these, just some gain calculations. Now, open loop is a different case. That's where the feedback resistor is missing. Notice there isn't a resistor from the output back over to the uh, inverting input. And this, this has some magic properties. A lot of blue text here. When the input voltage crosses the threshold of reference value, well, what's the threshold reference value? That's the value on two. So pins two and three are looking at each other to see which one seeing if they're same or greater or less. So when the input voltage, in this case in, comes into the non-inverting, or the, into the inverting input, pin three, when the input voltage crosses the threshold reference value, the output state will switch. Well, how do we determine the, the reference value? That's on pin two, and we've got another voltage divider here. We've got the plus V plus, which is battery voltage, your power supply voltage, across R1 to R2 to ground. So at this point right here, whatever that voltage is, uh, let's just say it's uh, six volts for the fun of it. So we've got six volts on pin two. As soon as pin three gets above that, it's going to switch. Now there's a concept called hysteresis, and Kastler mentioned this in his video, and hysteresis just means a delay in the expected effect. And the way that I like to think of this is your home uh, HVAC system. You're, if, if it's, it's summertime and you've set your thermostat to 75 degrees and it's 80 degrees in your house, your thermostat's gonna be calling for cooling. So your, your house is gonna cool down to about 75 degrees and then the AC will shut off and it'll start getting warm again. But you don't want the AC to, to start up again when it gets to 75.02 degrees. <laughs> You'd like it to get up to 76, uh, let's say 76 degrees, so that it won't be uh, cutting in and cutting out every, every few minutes or every few seconds. So the th same thing happens here. Uh, noise on the input 
or very slight differences in voltage, the output could be chattering, could be going back and forth. So hysteresis uh, will cause that not to happen. Let's see how that works. R3, that's this resistor right here, is hooked to the output. So if this goes low, it's going to pull this reference low a little bit, causing the input to have to rise a bit more than what it was before in order for it to switch. And then you can control how big a gap you want between the two. So hysteresis prevents noise from causing unstable output. And that can be because of noise or just the, the, the inputs are too close together, be switching too fast. And then there's another concept here called the open loop input offset voltage. Talk about that definition. That's the differential input voltage that would be between these two inputs. The differential input voltage needed to bring the open loop output voltage to zero. So in theory, if these were um, both at zero, this should be at zero, or the same value, this should be at the zero. Uh, in practice, that doesn't quite work out that way because it's got such high gain, it's pretty difficult to calibrate it exactly so that, that uh, zero inputs would give you zero output. So the differential input voltage is the voltage needed to bring the output to exactly zero which won't be exactly zero, but these, these are words that'll show up. Speaking of which, here we are. What is the function of hysteresis in a comparator? If you say something about air conditioning. Yep, yeah, exactly. What happens when the level of a comparator's input signal crosses the threshold? And don't say the air conditioning will kick on. B. Comparator changes its output state. What is the typical output impedance of an integrated circuit op amp? Well, the theoretical output impedance is zero. But the pool question wants us to say very low. What is the typical input impedance of an IC op amp? Very high, exactly. What is meant uh, by the term op amp input offset voltage? A lot of words here. We talked about it. Might have to read this a little bit. Give you a second to read through it. Yep, it's C. It's not the uh, yeah, so this one you would have got wrong. Yeah, yeah, we, we found, figured out that a lot of times if you don't know what answer, pick the longest one. That would have got you in trouble on this one. So it's the, it's the uh, offset, input offset voltage is the different differential input, meaning between the inverting and non-verting input, needed to bring the open loop output voltage to zero. That's what you talked about. Voltage That's what I talked about, zero. yes. Yeah. So we're, we're this, this is kind of a memory test, short-term yeah. short, short -term memory. We'll, we talk about it, and then we see it in the pool questions. And then what you all will need to do is hopefully not tonight. After tonight, you feel burned out and just want to go to bed. But hopefully tomorrow, you, if we'll do a full chapter review, these things will come back, and you'll find out if you remembered them or not. And if not, just, just do them again. That's, that's how you get them into long-term memory. How does the gain of an ideal op amp vary with frequency? Now notice the word ideal. We notice that a real one, the frequency rolls off. Uh, in other words, it doesn't work as well at high frequencies. But the ideal op amp is? It does not vary with frequency. I don't know if I mentioned this, but op, op amps are fairly low frequency devices. Usually you won't see them in applications over a few hundred uh, kilohertz. So these, these aren't used at RF frequencies. You might be able to buy them for RF frequencies, but you'd have to mortgage your house in order to buy one. What is, okay, now here, you'll need to get out your calculator. What magnitude of voltage gain can be expected from the circuit in this uh, figure when R1 is 10 ohms and RF is 470? Well, you don't need your calculator for that one, right? 
All right, this one, unless you remember it, you might need to calculate. That's 38, 68 divided by 1.8, correct? See, I told you these were easy. What absolute voltage gain can be expected from the circuit in this figure? Same kind of question. Yeah, did you did you calculate it or just estimate it? Oh, do it in your head. Okay. Well, and some of our heads are are different different than others, right? So my my head, I have to get the calculator. But see see if that will come out correct if you, if you do use the calculator. Forty seven, if does that work? Divided by three point three. You all look like you're agreeing. You agree, John? Yeah. Okay, awesome. All right, and then this is the hardest one there because you have to think a little bit, and I won't give you the answer. You have to figure this out. What will be the output voltage of this circuit if R1 is 1,000 ohms, RF is 10,000 ohms, and 0.23 volts DC is applied to the input? So how do we approach that? Yes, find the input voltage, multiply it by, by the gain. Now, what's the gain going to be? It will be 10,000 divided by... Um, mm -hmm. Okay, which would be 10. All right, so what would that make the output voltage? We're applying um, 0.23 on the input. What are we going to have on the output? That's not inverted. It is. It's the input is coming in on the inverted input, so the output is. It'll be negative 2.3, 0.23 times 10, and then it's going to be negative because it's coming in on the inverted input. Good. That's the hardest one in this chapter, <laughs> in terms of math. And because it is the only one, you might be able to remember it. But notice all of the distractor answers here. Um, there's lots of ways you could get this wrong if, if you don't think through it. Good. You're doing really well. Now here they're asking for the definition. So see if you can remember all of those words. What is an integrated circuit operational amplifier? You'll have to kind of sort through the ones that don't make any sense because they all have a lot of words in them. We'll see what you all vote on here. It is A, high gain direct coupled, which means it'll amplify DC. Differential amplifier, it's taking the difference between the inputs with very high input impedance, very low output impedance. Let's see if any of the other ones even come close. Okay, it's, not it's not digital, it's an analog device, so that's why B is wrong. Amplifier used to increase the average output of frequency. Okay, it's got nothing to do with, with that. RF amplifier used in the UHF. No, it's a low, low frequency device. So not only did we pick out the right answer, but we see why the, the other ones are wrong. Excellent. All right. Now we're going to get into a section that has confused people somewhat in the past. I think this is the third, third time we've taught the extra, isn't it, Gary? Or is it the fourth? Third time. Okay. And yeah, this has been kind of a stumbling block. So I've, I've approached this from three different ways and included a review slide for the pool questions that apply. And I'm anticipating that we're going to get them all right. But this, this might take some mental gymnastics. So buckle your seatbelt and hang in there with me. So we're going to talk about amplifier classes. Now that has to do with how much, uh, what, how an, op an amplifier operates with a given input signal. So here we've got an input signal being applied to an amplifier, and we've got class A, B, A, B, and C. When I say it's how the ampli or how, how the circuit operates, it's how much appears in the output for that input signal. Notice that these are all inverted. So we start out with the input, positive going voltage, and it comes out a negative go voltage negative going voltage coming out, which is characteristic of a common emitter uh, amplifier, by the way, or common cathode. 
So with class A, we bias the transistor, more on that in a minute, but we bias the transistor so that the output is a very faithful uh, representation of the input waveform. No distortion in an exact copy, except that it's inverted. So that's class A. For that to, to work, that amplifier has to be conducting continuously at the very, at, at zero, and at the peak, zero, negative peak, back to zero, in order to get that output. Class B, we're gonna bias the transistor so that it's going to have a very distorted output, but there's a reason for doing that, and that's efficiency. Uh, class A, because the transistor's on all the time, it's not a very efficient amplifier. Class B, since it's only conducting on half of the input waveform, it's much more efficient, but the output is very distorted. Uh, but that's not always a bad thing, and we'll go through some of those cases. Class AB is a combination of the two. It's a little bit more than half the input waveform. And class C, we're just using a little bit. So the input is here, and we're only gonna be having the transistor conduct on, on the peaks, on one of the peaks, positive going peak on the input. You're probably wondering why in the world would you wanna do any of that? Or we're gonna get into that next. And then there's something called class D. There are a couple of pool questions on class D but we won't be spending too much time in figuring out what class D actually does. We talked about switching power supplies in the past and switching power supplies are, are pretty complicated. We've got a, a waveform like a reference sawtooth waveform. We've got the input here and then a comparator circuit that's doing something called uh, pulse width modulation out of the output and then a filter to convert it back into a sine wave. You won't see these very often in amateur radio, probably more so going forward, but it works uh, similar to a switching power supply. But I need to mention it because there are a couple of pool questions just to ask you about its characteristics. So here's the first pass. And then there's one question, well there's one pool question that asks about uh, how does a class AB amplifier work? And you can see from the diagram here, and it's conducting for more than 180. The entire waveform is 360. So a class AB amplifier is conducting for more than 180, but less than 360. So those, those are the words and the answer that you need to know. Okay, here's another run at the, basically the same information. Uh, but this, this time in terms of what we'll see in the pool questions. So for a class A amplifier, notice the same classes are here that we talked about in the previous slide. For a cl class A, it says the bias, which means where the transistor is set, is set at about halfway on the load line. All right, well, what in the world is that talking about? Let me flip forward one slide. This is a, a, a picture of a load line. You might remember the a transistor, if we're using it as, as a switch, if it's uh, fully turned on, if it's turned on all the way, what, what's that called? Word for that? Saturated, yeah, it's saturated. Meaning you've turned it on as hard as you can and you can't turn it on any harder, it won't put out any more current. If the transistor is biased so that it's not conducting anything at all, that's cut off. So somewhere between the cutoff point and the saturation point, if we bias that transistor someplace in the middle, that'll give it a pretty good swing, both up and down, which would allow it to operate as a class A amplifier. So for right now, just kind of take that as a concept. Let me flip back. So now this might make a little more sense. For a class A area, the bias is set at about halfway on the load line between cutoff and saturation. So there's a good amount of space there for the, the signal to operate the input, the circuit operate against the input signal. Now class B, the bias is set at the cutoff level. So if the bias is set at the cutoff level, that means the transistor is just turned off. So on positive peaks, it would conduct, but on negative peaks, it would not conduct. And that's what class B is, it conducts for 180 degrees. Class AB, we saw operates between the 180 and 360 points of the signal cycle. 
Again, where you've biased the transistor will determine that. In class C, the bias will be set well into the cutoff region so that only the very peaks of the input signal will allow that transistor to conduct. Then here's the two questions on class D. Class D, <clears throat> excuse me, uses switching technology to achieve high efficiency because with a switching circuit, the transistor is either all the way on or all the way off, very efficient and it requires a low pass filter on the output to remove the harmonics, which makes sense. We'll see more and more of these going forward. It was, this is very complex uh, electronically to design, but our engineers have been getting smarter and smarter. So we'll, we'll see more class D amplifiers going forward. But for now, you just need to know these two facts about class D. So that's the second wave through this topic. And here's the, the load uh, line diagram that I showed you. There's one in the book that I thought was helpful as well. Um, this is from page 6-10, in case you can't read it here. But it, this, this is a little different view of the same load line concept. Um, here we've got the cutoff region here. We've got the saturation region up here. And in between the two, there's a fairly straight line where the signal coming into the transistor is faithfully reproduced on the output. So this area of the curve right here is where class A would operate, which it says here, class A limits from, um, from cutoff to saturation, but operating in between. Class B is gonna be operating in a different part of the curve, and class C is gonna be way down here, mostly cut off. So the, this was kind of helpful to me just to see it from a, from a different point of view. So that's, that's the third time through. We've got one more. This is the Dave Kassler. Now Dave Kassler um, likened this to a flywheel. Remember we talked about a flywheel in resonant circuits? Does anybody remember that concept? Where uh, an inductor is uh, creating a magnetic field when you put current through it capacitor is storing uh, electrostatic energy. And when the two are in parallel or in series, they're exchanging current back and forth, or exchanging the field energy back and forth between them, high circulating currents. Hopefully some of this is ringing some bells and coming back. Um, well, that forms a tank circuit. So we saw that with a coil and a capacitor in a tank circuit, if you took the input voltage away, they would continue exchanging energy between the coil and the capacitor until the resistance in the circuit caused it to die out. It's kind of like hitting a guitar string and having, having the sound slowly die out. Well, same thing works here. So in his uh, analogy, a class A amplifier is always pushing the flywheel. The transistor is conducting through every part of the input cycle. Class B, it's only pushing it halfway around. But because of the tank circuit, the energy is being exchanged, it will continue to function by the time you come around and give it another push. With class C, you're just bumping it a little bit. I don't know if you remember the pendulum. He was showing he had a pendulum and you just push the pendulum a little bit and it would, would start swinging. You push it a little bit, it would, it would keep swinging. That's the concept here. So this has to do with RF circuits. So that's the fourth time through the, the concept. So here's a review of, the, of the, review of the pool questions. For class A, bias is set at about halfway on the load line. Okay, we've gone over that. Class A, B, I'll just talk about the ones that are in the pool questions. Class A, B operates between the 180 and 360 points of the signal input, the signal cycle. Class B uses switching technology to achieve high efficiency, it requires low pass filter on the output to remove the harmonics. So hopefully that'll relate back to the, the principles of why that's true, and that, that'll help you when you see that again. There's a couple of other things we need to touch on. Why would you use one operating class over another? And you've probably been wondering about that, telling you all of this stuff, well, what is it good for? So what? For AM and single sideband, it's extremely important that everything be linear because we're dealing with, with audio. And if we have a bunch of distortion like we'd have in a class B or class C, um, that would be really bad for AM or single sideband. 
CW doesn't really care because that flywheel effect would, would have the signal continuing to go out. And FM only works on change in frequency and carriers continuous, so FM wouldn't care either. In fact, uh, some of you might have heard of brick amplifiers used for two meter radios. Those, those are class C amplifiers that you'd never want to use for single sideband on two meters. So you can actually buy things like that. Using a class C amp for AM or single sideband will, will result in distortion and excessive bandwidth. And class B amplifiers, something unique to B, can be used by connecting two of them in push-pull to eliminate even order harmonics. Now this is a circuit um, that's actually for an audio amplifier, but you see that this transistor's, uh, this is class B, this is class B, this transistor is only amplifying the negative peaks. This transistor is only amplifying the positive peaks. And when you put them together, you get a complete waveform coming out of it. So a class B amplifier operating in push-pull will, uh, will be fairly distortion-free. This is an audio amplifier circuit, but it works in RF as well. Different components. Now, a couple of comments on distortion and intermodulation. I've got a couple of slides on intermodulation math coming up that you don't have to understand, but the way the pool questions are, are worded, they make some assumptions, they, they use some terms that really bothered me because I didn't know what they meant at first. So I'll, I'll go through that, but um, I'll uh, bear, bear with me if, if you don't care to follow the math. So before I get there, though, distortion and intermodulation, another part of our chapter, Nonlinearity produces distortion. I think we would agree with that. Distortion results in harmonics, something bad. And you can have low distortion or high efficiency, but not, not both. It's hard to achieve both, so it's a, a trade-off. And here's a picture of some clipped waveforms that, that would result in, in distortion. Now, intermodulation. All right, two or more signals mixed to produce other signals. Now, if you've got two signals being applied to any kind of a circuit component, either you'll have those same two signals coming out or you'll have a whole bunch of signals coming out. Remember we talked about mixers and we got into the general material, I think maybe even the technician, but, um, and we'll be doing more of that as well coming up. But um, if, if the circuit that you're applying these signals to is nonlinear, it's going to be creating uh, products, some indifference products. So intermodulation is defined as two or more signals mixed to produce other signals. Third order products are close to the desired frequency. Well, what in the world does that mean? <laughs> I'm going to try to explain it. Uh, you don't necessarily need to understand it, but you do need to know that third order products are close to the desired frequency. In this case, we've got F1 and F2. Those are the two signals coming in. And we've got intermodulation products. Notice the even spacing. They, they, it turns out that the difference between these two signals appear at exactly that difference in little bumps going up. And the higher, the further out they get, the weaker they are. So this is the third order product 3L means it's a third order product below the pair, fifth, seventh, ninth, and here it is coming out that way. So third. Something different than uh, harmonics? Yes, I'll get to that in a minute. Mm -hmm. Yep, these are, are another kind of mixing products, which I'll explain. Now, even, now these are third order products. Even order products produce, uh, products result in spurious signals or harmonics. All right. Now let's see how that works. We're gonna, I, I think in Gary's chapter coming up, he's gonna talk about inter, intermod, um, and he'll do it in terms of, of audio frequency and, and single sideband. Uh, I'll, I'll use a slightly different approach, but the principle is the same. I'll, I'll use RF frequencies to, to demonstrate this in the next two slides. Now notice that there's only one piece of blue text here. So if, if you have trouble following all of this, don't worry about it. We just need to know this one fact which we've already shared over here. Third order products are close to the desired frequency. All right, so I'm gonna spend just a minute talking about why that is. 
So for these two frequencies, I'm going to assume 7 megahertz and 7.1 megahertz are present for, for whatever reason. Now we want to consider the mixing product 2A minus B, which means two times this frequency minus this one. And mixing works that way. It takes everything and combines it in a, in a big mess. So consider mixing product 2A minus B. This is called the th a third order product. And if you do the math, 2 times A minus B, 2 times 7 megahertz minus 7.1 megahertz, the third order product gets 6.9 megahertz. Notice that that difference is the difference between these two. Just move down the band a little bit. So why is it called the third order product? All right. Well, it's um, 2A minus B, which is 2 times 7 megahertz times 1 times 7.1. I put these in green. These are called coefficients. And the sum of the coefficients is, is odd. And if that doesn't make sense, don't worry about it yet. So now let's consider um, this mixing product. We did 2A minus B, now we're going to do 2B minus A. This is also a third order product, and it comes out up here. Third order products are close to the desired frequency. Now let's take the next one, 3A minus 2B is a fifth order product. Three plus two is five. And that re results in one at 6.8 megahertz down here. The other one, 3B minus 2A, winds up with a product, a fifth order product up here. So odd order products are often in band. Notice that, that these are all in the ham band except the ones that are below um, seven megahertz. So that's how odd order products work and why they're called a third order product and a fifth order product. Now let's consider even order products. Again, just one little piece of blue text here. Even order products result in spurious signals or harmonics, as was mentioned. Again, we're gonna assume seven megahertz and 7.1. So let's consider the, the mixing product A plus B. This is a second order product. 1 times 7 plus 1 times 7. And green are the coefficients. If you add those up, it's 2, which is even. Gives you a signal at 14.1. Well, 14.1 is way above 7 megahertz. It's a long ways out. It's more of a harmonic. Now, consider this one, 2A plus 2B. This is a fourth order product, and it winds up uh, in the 10 meter band, 28.2. So th that, that's how these things come together and play but you only have to know those two facts. If, if that doesn't make a lot of sense, um, you just need to understand these two facts and, and you'll have it. But it, it's really hard to explain that and the book just kind of un assumes that you know what they're talking about when they talk about odd order products and even order products. And I wanted to give you a little bit of context about what, what that actually meant. So if, if you're all sleeping and mad at me, um, get over it, no. <laughs> Uh, one more section here, and we'll have a story. Instability and parasitic oscillation, excessive gain or positive feedback may cause amplifier instability. And that would be a bad thing, because if an amplifier started oscillating and it was a high-powered amplifier, you could be putting out signals who knows where. It'd be a very bad thing. Oscillation can be prevented by neutralizing the stage or by parasitic suppression. Um, we haven't talked a lot about that, but we, we remember the, the parasitic suppressors, the, the, the ferrite beads that we looked at, I think uh, last, last time we talked, those can be used in amplifiers to, to cut down uh, parasitic effects as well. Neutralizing is something that's normally done in a, a tube type amp to eliminate oscillations. One way to neutralize an RF power amplifier is by feeding a 180 degree out of phase portion of the output back to the input. So if, if it's in phase, it's going to oscillate. Just like if I put my microphone in front of the speaker, you'd hear a horrible howl. Um, but if, if I were to actually reverse the microphone leads to invert the phase, it might eliminate the howl or make, make it different anyway. Well, we do sort of the same thing in a, in a high-powered amplifier by feedback, feedback out of phase so that it won't oscillate. Parasitics are oscillations that are not related to the operating frequency of the amplifier. In other words, the amplifier is just off doing whatever it wants. It, it's oscillating at some place where you don't want it to be at all. 
and it may be above or below the operating frequency. The next slide that I have here, I think is a Voice of America transmitter, is that right, Gary? That's right, that's a General Electric 250,000 watt HF transmitter. 250,000 watts, and what, what happened? Well, um, these, this transfer, I think, is coming from uh, Greenville, South uh, North Carolina. Uh, but when I was assigned overseas to Monrovia, Liberia, we had the same transmitters there. And um, we had a problem with a tube uh, that, um, come to find out, uh, it was oscillating at VHF, uh, giving the transmitter all sorts of strange operating characteristics. And... Uh, taking out vacuum uh, capacitors, uh, which are priced at about $1,500 each, taking them out like peanuts. So it took a long time to figure out what the heck's going on, mm -hmm. uh, but it was parasitics yep. in the tube. And yep. changing the tube cured the problem. Wow. Wow. How many watts did you say? 250,000. Okay. That's something else you can put on your Christmas list, but just don't operate it in the U.S. Yep. Yes, exactly. So this stuff is important. <laughs> Won't be that dramatic. Okay, some questions, and then we'll be taking a break after these questions. For what portion, okay, go back. Let's see if we, we got some of this to stick now. For what portion of a signal cycle does a class AB amplifier operate? Good, awesome. I don't know if anybody in our last class got that one right, so. <laughs> you guys are just so much smarter. <laughs> Actually, I'm <laughs> probably teaching it better and you're smarter. What is a class D amplifier? It is a type of amplifier that uses switching technology to achieve high efficiency, kind of like switching power supply circuitry become more popular going forward. Which of the following components form the output of a class D amplifier circuit? Remember it was full of pulses, so we've got to do something about that. It would be A. It's going to be a low pass filter because those, those pulses are, are coming pretty fast. So we, we want to use a low pass filter so that the, the audio or the RF can, can pass and filter out those high frequency uh, glitches, spikes. Good, very good. Where on the load line, that weird picture we had, where on the load line of a class A common emitter amplifier would bias normally be set? Uh, a. Approximately halfway between saturation and cutoff. Remember, that's, that's the point where it will be amplifying through the entire input waveform. Good fidelity, uh, low harmonics and distortion. Which of the following amplifier reduces or eliminates even order harmonics? We didn't spend a lot of time talking about this. In fact, I might not have used the term. It's push-pull because push one transistor is uh, pushing on the up, up rising on the increasing input signal. The other one is pulling down when it's doing the negative cycle. Push pull. Which of the following is likely a result when a class C amplifier is used to amplify a single sideband phone signal? Remember, single sideband and AM hate to have any kind of distortion in the amplifier. What does a class C amplifier do? Makes lots of distortion for an AM or a um, single sideband signal. So B, right. Is that what I heard? Sometimes I can't tell the difference between B and D. But a signal distortion and excessive bandwidth would occur for a class C amplifier. What are, uh, what are switching or why are switching amplifiers more efficient than linear amplifiers? They're normally either fully saturated or fully cut off. Yeah. 
Bravo. Power transistors at saturation are cut off most of the time, resulting in low power dissipation. Isn't a power transistor at saturation use a max power? Right, but for a very short time. And that, that, that's why this is a benefit. Yep, very short time. Good question. What is the effect of intermodulation products in a linear power amplifier? Something bad is going to happen. All right. Um, now, we talked about spurious signals, and we talked about intermodulation, and only one of those two appears in the, this list of answers. <laughs> so that, that, that's how you can narrow it down if you don't remember the specific um, things that we talked about. Intermodulation products would can cause the transmission of spurious signals. And the way they described it in the book, those spurious signals are the ones that are a long ways from the, the, what you're transmitting. So those, those would be the even order products, which would be uh, a, lo a long way from your carrier. In our case, we were talking about seven megahertz and 7.1. So this would be at 14 or 28 or some ridiculous distance away, which would be spurious signals. Why are odd order rather than even order intermodulation distortion products of concern in linear power amplifiers? And that's because they're close in, right? The odd order. Yep, odd order are close to the frequency, desired frequency, and probably would make it through your filters. And you'll see that in an audio sense in a, in a future class. I just used the, an RF carrier sense for, for my discussion. What can be done to prevent unwanted oscillations in an RF power amplifier? Like Gary's Voice of America transmitter? C install parasitic suppressors and or neutralize the stage. Now every, every tube, um, anytime you change tubes in a tube type amplifier, the internal geometries of the tubes aren't exactly the same. So external capacitance and or inductance needs to be adjusted to re-neutralize the, the amplifier. Um, and the instruction manual for your amplifier will tell you exactly how to do that. You need to do that when you change tubes. How can an RF power amplifier be neutralized? Well, do we want some in-phase feedback or some out-of-phase feedback? If it's in-phase, it's going to oscillate, right? If it's out-of-phase, it will dampen the oscillations. C. So it's C, by feeding a 180-degree out-of-phase portion of the output back to the input. And that, that, that amount of phase shift can differ a little bit because of the internal construction of the tube, which is why it needs to be readjusted and re-neutralized when you change tubes. Good. Well, we'll take a break at this point, and then we'll get into section 6.2, signal processing. I did bring a couple of show and tell things. We're going to be talking about crystals in a little bit, so I brought some crystal samples here. And the handbook is up here if anybody wants to look at it. So and just before we go to break, I'll just give you some feedback. Mm -hmm. We've had up to 13 people watching the stream. Uh, right now, we have 11. Uh, so we're getting feedback on the mm -hmm. chat. Okay. Uh, Fran McHugh says, are these being recorded and posted on YouTube? This presentation is definitely better than last year's, and that was good. All right. Yep. Five. Yep. Yeah, I, Take five minutes. I always spend hours before one of these classes going through what we did last year and, and fixing anything that could have been better. So, yeah, that, that was good feedback. So they're probably not listening to us right now, but that's much appreciated because we, we do make that a, a, attempt.
Testing, one, two, seven. Okay. So yeah, we're getting some multi-path there. Okay, is it working better now? We'll, we'll find out. Okay. But we, that may be something we need to upgrade. That's what we're okay. running here. So. All right. Ready to roll? We can go. Ready to roll. Okay, well, thanks for coming back. And uh, I noticed that we had one fewer online person than we started with, so we probably lost one person. But nobody in the room left yet, so that's a good thing. I appreciate that. All right. Now, oscillator circuits and characteristics is the next one. And oscillators are really pretty simple because all you have to have is an amplifier that has some gain greater than one and a feedback path from output to input that will cause it to sustain that oscillation. Just the opposite of what you want to do when you're neutralizing a transmit circuit. So amplifier gain, feedback ratio. If positive loop gain is greater than one, feedback is in phase, the circuit will oscillate. We won't worry about this diagram. Now there's three flavors, and it kind of sounds like a law firm. Colpitts, Hartley, and Pierce. Does that sound like a, like a law firm to you? Well, it isn't. These guys actually go back, um, this, this dates back from, I think Hassler mentioned, from 1915 through 1923, the three different guys that came up with this stuff. Well, just a comment for our online people. We are in a gym, in a classroom, so all of that noise you hear in the background is, is the kids playing basketball, just so you know. So the first one is coal pits, and there's a trick for remembering what this, uh, how it works. Coal pit starts with a C, capacitance starts with a C, so if you can remember that C fits capacitance and coal pits, you'll notice know that the coal pits works by operate, it provides its feedback through a capacitance divider. So here's, the, here's our, our capacitors and here's the divider, feeds back. That's how a coal pits works. Hartley uses a tapped inductance. Well, H is the first letter in the word Henry, which is the unit of inductance. So Henry and Hartley go together and a Hartley oscillator uses a tapped inductor. We see that here in the diagram. And then Pierce was the last one to come along, and it uses, for its feedback element, a crystal, a quartz crystal. And I've got some samples up here, in case some of you might not have seen one before. In fact, I've got one that's opened up and broken. You can actually see the leads attached to the, uh, to the quartz. And Pierce is the most stable of the three, because a quartz crystal will really lock you and hold you on frequency. And here's a circuit diagram. Something called microphonics. If you tap a microphone, like this one, you can hear the little ticking sound. Sometimes in a transmitter, especially one that's home brew, um, something you've built yourself, sometimes if you tap on it, you, you can hear that on the air. You can hear something tapping. That's called a microphonic. And it's due to the mechanical uh, movement of, of the parts in, the, in your radio. You don't see that too much in commercial equipment, but what it's caused by a change in the oscillator frequency due to mechanical vibration. How do you fix it? You have to either isolate mechanically the oscillator circuit from its enclosure. You can also uh, stiffen up the, uh, uh, the metal that's inside the, the unit so you won't have this mechanical vibration going on. But these are pool questions. Most common in homebrew transmitters. And you can tell if you've got that problem, I don't think any of you will, but if you're listening to a separate receiver, have a friend listening to you, you, you can be tapping on it to see if, if that would happen. And in, in troubleshooting, you can kind of go around and, and tap on different things to see what, what it is that, that's causing it to, uh, to occur. Because tubes and transistors can be microphonic, <coughs> excuse me, as well as uh, oscillator parts. Talk about crystals a little bit. It's a small wafer of quartz with precise dimensions. Here's a picture of one here. Piezoelectric effect. Uh, phono cartridges used uh, this effect. In some early microphones, you don't see it too much anymore, and even some headphones. It's a, a, an effect where mechanical deformation of a material, kind of a crystalline material, will um, cause voltage to appear across that device. And here I've got a, wish I had it this bigger, but here I've got a, a piezo, some piezo material, you're hitting it with a hammer, and here's a voltmeter hooked up to it, kind of a very crude <laughs> diagram. 
But that's the idea. Um, and you can understand why phono cartridge or microphone, if you talk to it, it, it could create a voltage because of this effect. Now, crystal, and the crystal is a piezo uh, device, or has that effect. Because the voltage put across the crystal will cause it to vibrate and be very precise. Crystals are very high Q. We talked about Q in a previous lesson. Crystals are very stable and precise. And they use a parallel external capacitance to ensure the proper frequency. Now, that's a capacitor that's recommended by the manufacturer. If you buy a crystal from whoever makes crystals these days, there will be a spec on what capacitor to put in parallel with it to cause it to be stable. And here's a picture of a uh, FT243. If any of you have been around for a really long time, um, back in the novice days, the 60s, um, the only thing you could use as your frequency determining element was, was a crystal. These could actually be disassembled. And hams would grind them manually to change the frequency. The grinding compound, or I think Gary said toothpaste. Toothpaste, toothpaste would work as a grinding compound. Oh, you could use all sorts of stuff. Like the the yeah. <laughs> yeah, to change the frequency yep. and then put it all back together. Or lead pencil, if, if you want to raise or lower the frequency, a lead pencil would, would change it a little bit. So, yeah, people used to grind these manually. And uh, you, it, as, as a novice, you were lucky if you had, uh, you know, half a dozen crystals. Those would be half a dozen frequencies you could operate on. That, that's what I used to have to do. I'm not old though, I'm, I'm very young. So oscillator thermal drift is, is a problem. Sometimes you can hear somebody uh, transmitting and slowly they're, they'll be creeping up or down the band as their transmitter is drifting. That's what's meant by oscillator thermal drift. You might drift with the equipment temperature, can be minimized by using parts with low temperature coefficients. Uh, what that means is as a part, let's say a capacitor heats up, it will physically either expand or contract, which can change the capacitance. There are such a thing as a negative, uh, or negative positive zero capacitors, NP0. Looks like NPO, but it's NP0. And those are designed so that any expansion and contraction offsets the electrical characteristics and they hold the same value. <clears throat> Another way to stop thermal drift is something called crystal ovens. It's a little container with insulation in it and a heater. And what happens is that the heater heats up, the crystal comes up to say 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And when it reaches that temperature, the heater turns off and it, it'll cycle and, and hold that, that temperature very close. And um, that, that's what a crystal oven is and holds the frequency. But the NPO is what you'll need to know. Oh, this, I love this. <laughs> There's words here that are just mind-boggling. Motional capacitance, motional inductance, and loss resistance in series, all in parallel with a shunt capacitor representing electrode and stray capacitance. That's the crystal circuit equivalence. And there is actually a pool question on that. But I'm, I'm going to give you a, a trick that will make that real easy. There's only one answer that has the word shunt capacitor in it, and, and that's how, how you can determine it. This is a circuit symbol for a, a crystal, and here's that equivalent circuit that we talked about. Now, the word motional capacitance, motional inductance, that means that those effects are only there when the uh, crystal is vibrating. But that's why all of the crazy words. This is the equivalent circuit, and this capacitor is not the one that the manufacturer recommends be put outside. This is internal to the, to the crystal package. Now that we can see that, I think these words will, will match. And then this, this was that other piece I was talking about. Manufacturer specifies an external parallel capacitance required for resonance at the design frequency. So that would be something that you'd hook across here. We'll see if we can we can recognize the word shunt capacitor when you see the, the hairy definition coming up. Variable frequency oscillators. Um, now, back when a, a, a VFO or variable frequency oscillator was a major step up for a ham that was limited to crystals before. 
And in order to vary the frequency of an oscillator, you have to change the capacitance or, or the inductance. Uh, and therefore, they had to be coal pits or Hartley circuit because those use capacitance and inductance to change the frequency. So a variable capacitor, variable inductor in coal pits or Hartley circuits would be used in a VFO. Must be varied. Variable capacitance is the most common. And it's not as stable as a crystal oscillator. They'll, they'll drift with temperature somewhat. But a VFO was a really big deal because you could go anywhere in the band with a VFO. Now, microwave oscillators are kind of a special breed. Uh, the, the kind of components that we've talked about so far um, don't work very well at microwave frequencies. So there's three um, primary ways to get a stable microwave frequency source. GPS signal reference, rubidium standard reference oscillator, or a temperature-controlled high-Q dielectric resonator. This kind of sounds like an all-of-the-above answer coming our way. So just kind of watch for that. And you, you can dig into this technology if, if you care to, uh, but most of us aren't going to be operating at microwave, at least in the early days of our ham radio career. OK, some questions. What are the three oscillator circuits used in amateur radio equipment? See if you can see if you can remember the words. It'd be hard to guess at this one. <laughs> yeah, there's yeah. That's not fair. Yeah, Pierce Fenner and Bean. I I love that one. What describes a microphonic? Exactly. Yep. And microphonics can be caused by other components if, if they're defective. How can an oscillator's microphonic response be reduced? Okay, an oscillator's microphonic response. Well, that's thermal drift. Is for. <clears throat> <clears throat> yeah, mechanically isolating the oscillator circuitry from its enclosure. Yeah, this uh, that's kind of a trick one. How is positive feedback supplied in a Hartley oscillator? It's going to be inductance or capacitance. Hartley goes with... Tap coil. Yeah, tap coil. Yep. Henry is the uh, unit of inductance. That's correct. Hartley, coil. How is positive feedback supplied in a coal pits oscillator? Coal pits and capacitance go together. Yep. Remember the C's. Or, or visualize. Yeah, that's, that's what the book is for. For learning. How is positive feedback supplied in a Pierce oscillator? Yep, exactly. Which of the following oscillator circuits are commonly used in VFOs? Remember we talked that there were only two that were really variable? Cole Pitts and Hartley. Yep. Uh, they were early pioneers in electronics, yeah, yeah. So that they have plausible answers for a lot of these um, distractors, as they call them. Which of the following components can be used to reduce thermal drift? And that's the one that Ken wants to answer, right? The NPO, NP0, NP0 capacitors. Which of the following is a technique for providing highly accurate and stable oscillators needed for microwave transmission and reception? That, that was the all of the above. And I'm sure the handbook, wherever it went, used to be over there. Oh, okay, somebody's looking at it. <clears throat> all right, I was hoping it didn't disappear. Because those, uh, if you put that on your Christmas list, just be aware that they're like 50, 60 bucks. They're, they're expensive, but worth it. Um, all right, what is the, okay, let's see. <laughs> this, this is the worst one in the whole pool as far as words. What is the equivalent circuit of a quartz crystal? Yeah, if you can remember, remember that that clue. 
and it. Yeah, I don't know if it's the longest one because this one looks just as long. Yeah, it looks pretty long. But shunt capacitor is the one that you want to uh, tune into, and you could we could go through these and, and determine why they they're wrong, but we we won't. Which of the following is an aspect of the piezoelectric effect? I had the picture of the hammer striking mechanical deformation of material by the application of a voltage. And that works the other way too. You can apply a voltage and it'll cause, cause a crystal to vibrate um, or a, a crystal headphone to make sound. So it'll create a voltage and respond to a voltage both. And this, this one I cheated on, so you probably already saw that. Which of the following must end to ensure that a crystal oscillator provides the frequency specified by the manufacturer? You had to add a parallel capacitor. Yep. Yep. It already has some internal capacitance in parallel, but that's not what this is talking about. It's an external part. All right, we'll continue on with frequency synthesis. Now, this is probably, well, it, it's the most complex thing that we've talked about tonight, but we're, it's only a couple of slides, and there's some key words that will, will key you in to the correct answers. So this won't take too long. Frequency synthesis, we're gonna talk about phase lock loops and digital uh, synthesis coming up, direct digital synthesis. First of all is phase lock loops. So when VFOs came out, um, probably back in the uh, 60s, or in that range, they were the greatest thing on, on Earth. Phase lock loops were the next frequency determining uh, technology to come out. And it's an elect here's a definition, electronic server loop, servo loop, reference, this, these are its parts, servo loop, reference oscillator, phase detector, low pass filter, and a voltage controlled oscillator. So with some digital electronics, it, it's figuring out a, a, a divide by ratio that uh, causes a reference signal to exist. That reference signal is then um, compared to a voltage controlled oscillator that's running. And then it compares the two and, and locks them in phase. So we're able to, to control a, a VCO basically with a reference signal that's determined uh, digitally. The, um, so, and it allows the radio's VFO to have the stability of a crystal oscillator because we're referencing it to a standard that, that's much more stable than our Culpit or, or Hartley oscillator. The capture range is the frequency range over which the circuit can lock. So. A phase lock loop will only cover a certain range of frequencies. And it can be used to demodulate FM signals because as frequencies are varying, the phase lock loop can generate an error voltage that be, can be converted to audio. But this, this is relatively old technology now. Everything now is direct digital synthesis. But these, these key words will help you answer the question. A few more. Any short-term variations in the frequency will cause phase noise. So one of the negatives of a phase lock loop is it's always drifting high, drifting low. It's always adjusting itself to be right on frequency. That's called hunting. Uh, and as it hunts, that, that's causing something called phase noise as it's drifting around a little, little bit. Not very much, but, but enough to cause discernible noise in a transmitted signal. So phase noise is the major spectral impurity of a phase lock loop synthesizer. And as I mentioned, they can also be used to demodulate FM, frequency modulated uh, signals. Phase lock loop. Phase lock loop. Yep. Yep, it's locking an oscillator to a, a reference. Then the next one is direct digital synthesizers. And all modern radios use this technology. And I've uh, highlighted a couple of things in blue. The parts for DDS uses a phase accumulator, a lookup table. Now the lookup table, what it's actually doing is putting together a picture of a sine wave. 
So all of these voltages that we're seeing here, this is a, a sine wave, but these are specific digital levels that are coming out of that lookup table to reconstruct a sine wave based on what we told it we want it to generate. So it uses a phase accumulator, keep track of where it is, a lookup table to generate the sine wave, a digital to analog converter, which is represented here, and a low pass anti-alias filter. Because it's all jagged, we need to smooth that out. And there's lots of little spikes and bumps here. So it needs to be a low pass filter to extract the, uh, sine, the sine wave back out of it. So that, that's why these two things are highlighted. Lookup table, low pass anti-alias filter. We don't have those in a face lock loop. Okay, so it reads the data from the adder. That's this part of the circuit here. A lookup table contains amplitude values to create the sine wave. That's what all of these stair steps are. Where do you get the lookup table? It's, it's uh, stored digitally inside the chip. Inside the chip. Yep. yep. It's inside the memory. Yep. Then, uh, so we've got the lookup table to convert um, the amplitude values to sine wave. That's this step, this step, this step, this step. That's what it means by amplitude values. Low pass filter. Oh, okay, and then the low pass filter to smooth it out. Now, in this case, we have no phase noise because it's not hunting, it, it's locked right on frequency, but spurs at discrete frequencies can be a problem because of all of this stuff that it's generating. <clears throat> so the quality of the filtering is very important. So that's DDS. All right, now we'll jump into some questions. What type of frequency synthesizer uses a phase accumulator, lookup table, digital to analog, and a low pass filter? That's the DDS. Yep. What information is contained in the lookup table of a direct digital synthesizer? That's what we make our sine waves out of, right? The amplitude values that represent the sine wave output. Yep, we're mapping, mapping that sine wave. What are the major spectral impurity components of direct digital synthesizers? And there, C. it is C, spurious signals. And fortunately in the answer, they don't confuse us by saying phase noise. <laughs> so that this is the only, only one that we talked about. That makes it easy. Phase noise comes from phase lock loops. What is a phase lock loop circuit? Okay, we're looking for the parts. Okay, I heard C, and that's correct. Electronic servo loop, phase detector, low pass filter. They didn't mention though the uh, anti alias. No, because that only exists with the DDS. Just the DDS. Yep, this is phase lock loop. Yep. Good, you caught that. What, which of these functions can be performed by phase lock loop? We know it can generate frequencies. What else can it do? Yep, yep. FM demodulation. All right, a little bit more mixers and modulators we'll talk about next. And mixers are used to change the frequency of a signal. We saw how that worked in super heterodyne receivers in another class. Can also be used to change frequencies in a transmitter, shift things up or down and excessive signals. Um, we saw the distortion and uh, intermod slide before. Excessive signals can cause spurious signals to be generated from a mixer. So all kinds of trash can come out of a mixer if, if, you're, if you hit it with too much signal. So what does the mixer output contain? Well, the input to a mixer and a receiver, we've got the frequency that we're trying to hear. We have the local oscillator, and then we've got the sum and difference frequencies. See if it says that input signal, oscillator signal, the sum of the two and the difference of the two. We saw a little uh, hint of that in the uh, intermodulation math slides that I showed you. Use a filter to select the proper. So we, uh, we feed these signals into the mixer and then we use a filter to pick out the frequency that we're interested in. 
Now let's look at modulators. Now what a modulator does is it just takes information, let's talk about single sideband, and impresses it on the radio frequency carrier so that you can transmit it. In this case, we're gonna look at AM, which is a different, as a single sideband is a form of AM. Process, okay, so a modulator is the process of adding information to an RF carrier. Here's an RF carrier. And then to that, we're gonna add the frequency components, the voice or data in the modulating signal. And it says it makes up the baseband. Baseband is a, is a term that has been confusing to a lot of people. Baseband is basically the signal that it gets applied to the modulator so that you can send it out over the air. For most of us, that means it's just gonna be a single sideband voice, or it'll be an audio signal or a digital signal. Um, with microwave, they actually multiplex different channels of microwave into what's called a baseband that applies to a modulator. <clears throat> but for us, it, for what we're doing, we will normally only have voice or data. But the definition is important. The frequency components, voice or data in the modulating signal, that means what we want to transmit, make up the baseband. And then amplitude modulation, you can see that we've combined the carrier with audio to come up with this combination, an amplitude modulated signal. Now single sideband, and uh, we've talked about, in fact, I can remember clearly the way Gary explained this, I think in the general, there's two ways to make single sideband. There's the filter method and the phasing method. Well, those are just reviewed here. We start with an AM signal, filter, you get rid of the carrier and one sideband. And then the phasing method, your quadrature method, um, which is most modern radios are doing now. This used to be very difficult. The quadrature method actually produces better audio, but it was extremely difficult with analog parts. It's very easy to do mathematically, which is why it's become popular. So it uses a 90 degree phase shift to cancel the carrier on one sideband. Easy to do. The, the math is called a Hilbert transform. Uh, I think I looked up Hilbert. I didn't put it in my notes here, but uh, the mathematician that existed way before his technology was understood well enough to be applied here. And it's currently the preferred method in radios using digital signal processing. The exam question, we're approaching the finish line here, which is awesome. What are the principal frequencies that appear at the output of a mixer circuit? put stuff in and we get something out. They want to know about the output. Yep, the sum and difference frequencies along with the original. Oh, you said B, right? I said B. Oh, okay, you're going to have to listen to this whole class again, sorry. <laughs> It'll be online for you to okay. All right, yeah. Yeah, and I'm, I'm sure that, uh, yeah, I'm sure you can see why C is correct. Two input frequencies along with their sum and differences. Sum and differences and square root. No, we don't know square roots. Yeah. So if, if you look at all four of them, this, this one will probably jump out at you. Thank you for letting me have fun with you. <laughs> My tires will be flat when I go out in the parking lot. Every... <clears throat> guess, what, guess what Dave said? Okay, what occurs when an excessive amount of signal energy reaches a mixer circuit? Yeah, a bunch of garbage is probably gonna come out that you don't want to have come out. What is one way single sideband phone signal can be generated? A single sideband, okay. I don't know if we talked about balanced modulators in tonight, but um, that's that's the circuit that cancels the carrier and gives you a double sideband signal. And then you have to filter out one of the sidebands. So I, I may not have mentioned that tonight, but that's that's one way. That would be the filter method. The the phasing method would be the uh, the the ninety degree phase shift the direct and quadrature signal combination, which we'll talk more about next week. So one way to generate is by using a balanced modulator followed by a filter. 
what is meant by the term baseband in radio communications? Just looking at all the answers here. In the modulating signal, yes. It's what you want to modulate the carrier with. So they've said it in kind of a funny way here, but um, we, we de deciphered it. So that was good. All right, a little bit more. Frequency and phase modulation, pre-emphasis, de-emphasis. And, but there was quite a bit uh, of discussion in the general class about this, so they just cover the highlights uh, here in the extra and in the extra pool. Now there's, there's two flavors of frequency modulation. Well, one is uh, that look the same when it's received. We've got direct FM and indirect FM, which is also called phase modulation. Direct FM directly changes the frequency of an oscillator. Can be, be produced with a reactance modulator. Anybody remember a device that changes capacitance with voltage? I think Gary told us about it. The vector diode, right? The common way of creating a reactance modulator. So direct FM can be produced with a reactance modulator on the oscillator. We're directly affecting the oscillator's frequency, shifting it up and down at the audio frequency to create FM, frequency modulation. The other one is indirect FM or phase modulation. And this, uh, in this case, we're shifting, well, let me read it. Uh, PM signals can be produced by electrically, by electrically variable capacitance or inductance, uses a reactance modulator same as up here, but it varies the tuning of an RF amplifier tank circuit that's beyond the oscillator. So it's changing the phase. But on the received side, it sounds basically the same. There is one difference between phase modulators and direct FM in that phase modulation emphasizes the higher audio frequencies. Now, because you want it to sound the same on the received end, we have to do something with direct FM to make those two the same. So with direct FM, we apply something called pre-emphasis to emphasize the higher frequencies. And then we straighten that all out again on the receive side where we take the curve in the opposite direction. On the receive side, we want both direct and indirect FM to sound the same. So we've got pre-emphasis, which is usually for direct FM, which is something like 6 dB per octave and the pre-emphasis, and then on the receive side, it's just the opposite, 6 dB per octave de-emphasis. Is it six or 12? Do you remember, Gary? Well, at any rate, whatever it is going out, it's the opposite coming back. And you don't need to know that for the test. So here's frequency modulation, directly affecting the oscillator frequency. And we've got phase modulation, where we're changing a tank circuit behind the oscillator. Pre-emphasis is used on direct FM, as we mentioned, to boost the higher audio frequencies. So for direct FM, directly changing an oscillator, we have to use pre-emphasis so that it looks the same as phase modulation and can be decoded on the receive side correctly. The emphasis also has the uh, advantage of reducing high frequency noise because in an FM channel, if you want to call it that, there is a significant amount of high frequency noise and de-emphasis will cut that noise down. Detectors and demodulators. Okay, how do we get this information back once we've encoded it and sent it out over the air? So detector and demodulator will recover that information. And there's several flavors here. A diode detector, that's like the, crystal, the old crystal radios. It was just a diode that would rectify an AM signal and uh, convert it to audio so that you could hear it, amplify it and hear it. Works by rectifying and filtering the modulated AM signal. So diode detector, AM. Product detector is used with single sideband. It puts the carrier back in that we suppressed when we were transmitting it with the, the beat frequency oscillator used for single sideband CW and radio teletype. And then for FM, we use what's called a frequency discriminator. And that kind of makes sense, that the words make sense, because FM, we're varying the frequency, so we want to be able to discriminate the different values of frequency change that are happening using a frequency discriminator. 
Now, SDRs, software defined radios, kind of put all, turn all of that on, on its head. We'll talk about that next week. And uh, they, they do the detection in a very different way. It's all done in math. Which of the following can be used to generate FM phone emissions? There's two that sound plausible, but only one is right. So for FM phone, okay, well, <laughs> all right, well, let's walk through them. A balanced modulator is how we generate single sideband. And we're wanting to generate FM phone. Okay, so that's why it's not A. B, reactance modulator on the oscillator. That means we're changing the oscillator frequency directly, right, which generates FM. Reactance modulator on the final amplifier. Uh, if, if we were to use a reactance modulator, it would be on a stage much earlier than the final amplifier. And then a balanced modulator is not, that's a balanced modulator is for generating sideband and it's not used on an oscillator. So that's why it's B. Um, great. What is the function of a reactance modulator? We're coming at it in different, different ways here. Reactance modulator. Well, we know that we're not generating AM. It's some kind of phase modulation or frequency modulation. So it's either going to be A or D. Well, D is the longest. And we're not using an electrical variable resistance. We're using an electrically variable capacitance or inductance. <laughs> inductance or capacitance. Yep. How does an analog phase modulator function? Okay, a phase modulator is not direct FM. It's not changing the oscillator directly. It's going to apply to a tank circuit someplace. Okay, it can't be. Yes, during the tuning of an amplifier tank circuit will produce a phase modulated signal. They get a lot of questions out of the two or three slides that we had on the theory. What circuit is added to an FM transmitter to boost the higher audio frequencies? So we're boosting the higher frequencies. That's called either de-emphasis or pre-emphasis. It would be pre, pre-emphasis network. And we get that for free in a phase modulator. We have to add pre-emphasis with direct FM. Why is de-emphasis commonly used in FM communication receivers? This is on the receive side, where we're reversing the curve that we applied at the transmit side. If you're not sure, you might be able to noodle it out by getting rid of the ones that it probably can't be. Efficiency doesn't matter, correct? Minimum for third order distortion doesn't matter. Yep, that doesn't matter. And they haven't talked about impulse noise. Nope. So that leaves A, right? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> All right, and let's talk about why it's right. Um, for compatibility with transmitters using phase modulation, um, you, you might, um, I mentioned it, but went by it kind of quick. With phase modulation, where you're changing the phase of a, of a tank circuit that's later than the oscillator, that automatically emphasizes the, the higher frequencies. So because the high, high frequencies are emphasized, we need to de-emphasize them back on the receive side. So this, this fits. How does a diode detector function? Now what, what would be, we be demodulating with a diode detector? AM. AM. And it works by a diode passes current in one direction, right? So Zeter makes no sense. It's not a mixer. Yeah, that makes no sense. So that's it, by rectification filtering of RF signals. So diode detector, uh, if you can think of the old crystal radios, 
they, they had basically just a couple parts in them and one was a diode to uh, rectify the incoming AM signal um, so that they could hear it, rectifying and filtering. What type of detector is used for demodulating single sideband? Well, that, that's the product detector. Discriminator is for FM. Phase detector isn't really, yeah, so product detector is the, the only one that fits. Almost done. What is a frequency discriminator stage in an FM receiver? It's an FM receiver. We now we want to recover the the audio. D. Yeah, frequency discriminator that takes uh, those frequency changes and converts them back into audio by discriminating the, the frequencies that are changing. And guess what? That's the end. So don't worry about this tonight anymore, but tomorrow I'd highly recommend going through the, the full chapter review and uh, anything that you find that you trip on in the full chapter review, write it down or put a little flag on it if you're using the Q&A book and then, then work on eliminating the flags. Next week, uh, it's the remainder of chapter six. I'll send out an email. You'll also get a copy of the presentation and um, we'll wrap up chapter six. And I'm really excited about the first thing we'll be talking about, which is software defined radios, which is probably what are we doing for, what's the assignment? 6.3? Three to the end, 6.3 to the end. To the end of this chapter. To the chapter. Six. Yeah, okay. not the book. We're not going on to seven. No, Gary gets to do seven. <laughs> so we're we're all good. Thank you for hanging in there. This there is a ton of information in this chapter. Yes, so yeah. So it, it'll take some review to, to, to get it all to sink in. Right, right. But each each time you'll you'll get a few more and uh, yeah, there's a lot to remember. Yep, yeah, I'll I'll definitely grant you that. A lot there. <coughs> is last year 